Welcome to our new show. You are watching the first minute of the first show that we're hoping that will become a blessing to you. We're certainly looking forward to it for ourselves. We're calling it God's Prophetic Surprises, but it's really the book of Revelation. And we just love last day events and Revelation. We're hoping to go just verse by verse and hope that you'll just join us as we open up the Bible and go line by line and say, what does this mean for today? It's not a sermon. We're not going to preach, uh, though we're pastors and theologians and professors. It's not going to be a classroom where we now go through a lecture. It's really going to be more like maybe a coffee shop or a Bible study group where we just open up the text and say, what does this mean? So we hope that you'll just uh, begin to find out where we are or find it on the website and begin to be with us on God's prophetic surprises, GPS, how God is trying to tell us here at the end of the world how to navigate to get where we want to go. So we're going to get right to it. I'm just going to let the group uh, introduce themselves one by one, and then we're going to get right to the book of Revelation. So start. I'm John Pauline and uh, Dean of the School of Religion at Loma Linda University. How many years have you been working on the book of Revelation? I think professionally speaking, I probably started in 1981, so uh, good 30, 35 years. 35. <laughs> Were you born then? No. No? <laughs> so really in our advent of tradition, you're really sort of the dean. I think we were talking at lunch today, sort of the dean of Revelation Studies today. We're thrilled, John, to have you here. And uh, eventually we'll try to have your list of your books and so on so people on the website can, can track that. My name is Sarah Mae Colon. And I'm a pastor in Garden Grove with this guy. Yes. <laughs> so Sarah May is our youth pastor down at Garden Grove. We just ordained a few weeks ago. John was there as a, a mm -hmm. longtime mentor and family friend. It was a great, great day. We're very proud of her. Anyways, you're here to keep us uh, relevant and a little younger. <laughs> and, uh, and just ask the question, what does this really mean today? Mm -hmm. All right. My name is Sigve Tomstad, and I am a professor uh, of uh, Biblical Interpretation at the School of Religion at Loma Linda. Also right here at Loma Linda. And uh, John is my mentor and my dean. You uh, teach Revelation? I teach Revelation. I have uh, written my dissertation, doctoral dissertation, on the book of Revelation under the title Saving God's Reputation. A very good book if you can get a hold of it. it and, is, I, uh, yeah. and I am currently working on a commentary on the book of Revelation in the Paideia New Testament commentary series. Wow. And that you hope to be out next year sometime? Next year sometime, I hope. We will get the first free copy signed. <laughs> yeah. signed. Yes, yeah. of, course, of course. So we're pretty excited. Now, your accent is from? Norway. And somewhere I think I heard you were a doctor first. I am also a medical doctor. I'm trained at Loma Linda, and my specialty is internal medicine. But uh, you're full-time ministry theology professor. I, I am uh, working on biblical interpretation issues quite a okay. lot, yes, okay. that's true. I have just not to know you more recently. I've known your daughters because they were at La Sierra University when I was pastoring mm -hmm. there. Well, I'm uh, Dan Smith. I, uh, I'm a senior pastor down at Garden Grove in Orange County. And I'm really sort of the question asker and just try to keep it moving. These are our experts. We may bring a guest once in a while who just loves Revelation, and we'll just see how this goes. Give me a minute to, to ask, tell a story to lead into this question. I was at a, at a pastor's meeting in Ventura Monday night, so a couple hundred pastors. And some, uh, a pastor from New York, do you know him, Jose Cortez? Uh, I think we've met a couple times. Yeah, yeah terrific message. Mm -hmm. And he just said, two points, accept God's love and love others. That was it. Told a terrific story, three-year-old little boy in New York in the middle of winter as his birthday came up. He had to go buy what the son wanted. And at the store, there was little and there was medium and large. I think it was a car. And, you know, he thought about the cheaper one, but he thought, you know, it's my son. I'll, I'll max out. Got him the 9995 car. Wrapped it up, the little kid wakes up, where's my present? Brings in this huge present, the kid rips it open. And the father, he said, I was expecting hugs and kisses and I got a stamped foot, I got anger. And he said, what's wrong? Too big, I'm little, I can't use this, it's too little. Go take it back. He said, no, I'm not taking it back. This is what I got for you, you take this one. 
to make a long story short, which he embellished, <laughs> finally the little boy took that car, smashed it on the ground, and walked right out in the middle of winter into the snow to walk to New Jersey where the grandparents lived. <laughs> out. So he gets his little tricycle, and now he's riding on his tricycle from New York down the street to go to New Jersey. When he stubs his toe, the tricycle smashes into a wall, and, and he's crying, and his foot hurts, and he's walking in his underwear on the snow, <laughs> barefoot. And they're watching from the window, see how far this will go. <laughs> and, and he turns around, and he rings the doorbell, and he says, Papa, can I just come home? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the whole point. He takes that little boy, and he grabs him and says, you can always come home. And he said to us, that's our message. God is a God of love, except God's love. Why do we need revelation? Why do we need beasts and symbols and numbers and charts and all the complexity that people have wrestled with this book for 2,000 years if all we need is accept God's love? Why have you spent a lifetime in this mm -hmm. book? Well, maybe, maybe the question would be, uh, why does Revelation need this story mm. in order to be rightly understood? Mm. Because the reality is that, uh, is God less caring than a human parent? Uh, can you imagine the human parent turning away this three-year-old? Absolutely not. And yet that bond between parent and child that we know so well is a model hmm. for how God relates to us. Is that in the book of Revelation? I think that uh, we will find it there, <laughs> but a lot of people don't find it there. Yeah. And uh, because they don't find it there, I think uh, in this program, uh, we want to be affirming of the many constructive ways that people have read Revelation before, but we want to suggest there's more. Exactly. There's even more. And I think the challenge is that we're going to face is that we all already have these preconceived notions of what Revelation is, and that it's terrifying, and it's like doomsday speak, and just really intense and mm. scary, and instead we lose the message of love and hope in it. And so I think that's what we've, we hope to bring out of this, is the message of love and hope as opposed to this con, like condescending. I have, I have preached a series on Revelation and my whole pastoral staff said, why would you want to do that? You know, mm -hmm. Because of that fear, the perception. Where did the perception come from? And where did we get this sort of negative view of re Revelation? Well, I, I'd like to add to what has been said here that Revelation is a book that intends to be understood. It is all about that, in fact, in the first verse, it's all about something that you want to make it known. It should be revealed. So it should be, uh, so the revelation wants to be understood. Mm. But it is an intellectually demanding book. Mm -hmm. It is an ambitious book. So yes, it's not necessarily, you know, the sort of low grade, you know, you have to, you have to be willing to study, mm. but you will you will come away with understanding. And inside the book of Revelation, people understand it. And there is a, just a lot of joy mm -hmm. uh, as much as your, your story, in your story. Yes, yes. Well, that's yes. kind of astounding, you know, because I think most people, when they read the book of Revelation, they say, this is incomprehensible. But you're saying that it was designed to be understood. And if you're right, and I think we're going to be exploring that in this program, if you are right, then revelation is misunderstood more than it's understood. I agree with that. Yeah, and, and you and I, John and I have talked about this before because in our context, in our communal context, the Adventist context, we have a, a sort of a self-understanding that we understand the book of Revelation. That's part of our brand. But in some ways, we don't understand it. The average person probably you know, may not do that, but we have Dr. Pauline, we have others who understand it for us, you know, and we think that is a, a, a sort of disservice to the book of Revelation. Absolutely. It isn't supposed to be understood by the expert. Mm. We cannot go on having, you know, somebody understanding it for us. We need to understand it for ourselves. Oh, you anybody know, anybody can? Are you, are you saying that anybody can? I am saying that anyone can. It is an intellectually uh, ambitious book. But yes, this book is meant to be understood by anyone. 
When but John you, wrote it, he used a letter sending to churches, yeah. and they listened to someone read it sitting there in their church. And, and to people who were largely uh, couldn't read themselves. So they had to read it out loud, and somebody probably had to <coughs> read it to them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. Well, you talk about expert and stuff like that. And I, I want to say a word about that. Um, you know, you, you, you do a dissertation or some people think you're an expert all of a sudden on a lot of things. You know what a dissertation actually does? It's, it's, more. it's like a farmer who's at the edge of the field. And if all the farmer knows is the field, the surface of the field, you can say, I understand this field. But a dissertation is like digging a post hole hmm. at the edge of that field. And now you know the contents of that post hole. But what have you learned when you do that? You have learned how deep the field goes and how little you know mm -hmm. about the rest of the field. Mm -hmm. So actually, the more you know truly on any subject, the more you realize how much you don't know. So when you say Book of Revelation can be understood, I think it was intended to be understood, but it's also intended to be deep enough. I, I sometimes... Uh, compare it to a computer game where your reward for conquering a level is to get to a harder level. Mm. And in Revelation, I think one reason people are puzzled by the book is because as they go deeper, the book deepens with them. Wow, wow. And there's new dimensions. And frankly, um, I feel the weight of that just now as we're beginning this program. And I, I don't, if you don't mind, I'd just like to do some praying in preparation for that. You bet. Okay, Lord... As we're starting out on this program, seeking your guiding point, your GPS system for our lives, I, I feel the weight of how little I know about the book of Revelation. And I pray that you will be with us. You'll open our minds and hearts so that those who engage with us uh, on the television or by video, that they too may find you guiding them that they may discover your GPS for their system and their life as well. So, Lord, we need you very strongly just now, and we thank you that you can be with us even here as we present this program. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we've established so far that, that God wants us to understand this, and it's available. It may take some work, but it's available to everybody if you're open to the text and that it's not supposed to be all fear and gloom and doom. I got one more question before we maybe get into the text itself. You know the old joke that said, uh, someone at the graduation said, I regret to tell you that half of what you have learned here was wrong. The problem is I can't tell you which half. <laughs> we have studied Revelation for 2,000 years. How many commentaries so far, Dick? How many do you have right on your shelf? I don't know, but I know when I did my dissertation, there were at least uh, four or five hundred that I referenced. Uh, just your in, own? In, just slips. in the bibliography, and there were others that I looked at and didn't include because I didn't think they had enough distinctive content. Yeah. My wife's a librarian, and yes, it, it goes mm -hmm. many shelves. 2,200 items uh, in the library at Andrews University in 1987 when I completed that work. Wow. Many since then. Just on the book of Revelation. And so everybody reads the book and studies and thinks, I have a new, something new, and now you're going to be one more. <laughs> and, and we put it out there for the mm -hmm. world to read. So my question is, <laughs> what are the odds that we will be right on something? Uh, <laughs> these symbols are there. There's difficult. People read these symbols. What, what are the odds that we will be any better than anyone else? How do you handle that? Well, I... I I say there are some rules, there are some, you know, methods, uh, and I would like to, uh, already at this stage, to say there is one prerequisite, one entrance requirement to Revelation. You read it, and what do you do after that? After that, you read it again. Mm -hmm. Revelation is for re-readers. So, I would in, say, even emphasize it, uh, to, to say if you plan to read Revelation once, don't do it because Revelation is for re-readers only. It is in some ways also a review of the whole Old mm. Testament because it, it echoes, as John mm. has shown in much of his work, how much of the Old Testament you, 
reappears in the book of Revelation. So you are rereading the whole Bible when you read Revelation. It's very amazing. I read a quote somewhere that all of Scripture finds its end in, in Revelation. Yeah, yeah, it's very amazing. Which means that it can kind of tie everything together. So, so that's one reason to read Revelation uh, in spite of the challenges people have because it connects the whole Bible together. In a real Why sense. does God use the symbols and numbers and beasts? Why not just call it out straight and just say, it is ISIS, it is why beasts and, and, and so that there's so many different views. Uh, why not just be very specific and precise and so that we don't have to wonder and interpret it? What was the reason for all of that? Well, one theory uh, that's been held for a long time was that the early Christians were outcasts in the Roman Empire. And so the book used symbolism so that the Romans uh, wouldn't know what they were talking about. Really? So that's one, I did not know that. one theory. Yeah. Well, because uh, obviously just looking at the book of Revelation on the surface, it's, it can be hard to figure out. Well, the other, and, the, and another reason is that it is actually looking back to the Old Testament as a very important, you know, influence. And, you know, you have the beast there. You have, you know, you have a, a precedent in, in, in the Old Testament. So. Did the people sitting in Laodicea when they got the letter, did they understand it more naturally because they lived in that world and that culture? Were these symbols more clear to them than they are to us? I think they were, uh, definitely. Uh, I think it all comes back to what God is like. Uh, is God going to go to somebody on an island 2,000 years ago and say, okay, I got a message, but this message is only for people living 2,000 years later. Mm -hmm. right. That's how we sometimes read the book, mm -hmm. as if it were written to us. Now, either God got his timing off, you know, maybe a day with him is 1,000 years, so he's only two days off or something. I, don't, I somehow don't think so. I think God gave it in that time and that place because it would have a powerful impact in that time and at that place. That doesn't contradict the idea that God's going to speak to us, but I think if we want to understand it God's way, we got to go back and see why God did it back then. So I have a question based off of that then, because a lot of people refer to Revelation just as the apocalyptic book or the end of times book, and it's not necessarily relevant now. It's only relevant in the far future, at the end of the world. But well, yeah, that's the other thing. Let's just say it was written for a thousand years right. from now. So then what are we doing? It just goes right over the top, <laughs> exactly. yeah. <laughs> and so how do we address that issue? Because I know a lot of my friends are like, well, is it even relevant now? And so you're a nerd with this kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I like to, to say that revelation exists for a theological reason, that for the kind of person God is, and God is a talking person. Mm -hmm. God communicates. God informs. Mm -hmm. In uh, one of the texts that is echoed in, in Revelation, it says that God does nothing without telling his servants the prophets. Mm -hmm. you know, and that text itself echoes back to Abraham, where God is talking and thinking out loud, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm up to doing, what, you know, the way I do things? So, Revelation is in the character of God to, mm. to show what he, God is up to, what God is like. And, and many people think, well, what was the situation? Why was it written? Well, one reason is the kind of person God is. Mm -hmm. Well, we have these summary statements all the way through the book. You know, at the end, Revelation 15, Revelation 19, 2, where God is fair, God is just and true, yeah, God is, true. God is, God is. So clearly that's implying that the rest, the rest of the book was leading to those summations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is who God really is. Well, I think uh, uh, it's important to recognize that one of the clearest principles I've learned in 35 years or so of studying uh, this book and, and other parts of the Bible is that God meets people where they are. Mm -hmm. That God, whenever God comes to human beings, he comes in that time and place. And the perfect example is Jesus himself. If Jesus truly, as the Bible says, came from heaven to be here, he came, you know, not as an American, not as a German, you know, not as an African. He came to a people where he became a Jew among Jews, 
Uh, he became a carpenter who fit right into the lifestyle back then. He wore the clothes that they wore. He spoke the languages that they spoke. Not our language, didn't speak English. <laughs> so God in Jesus met them where they were and then gave four gospels. What's the point of four gospels unless it's important to God that people of different minds and different personalities find a handle on this That's story? Right. That's right. You know, so uh, those are just two examples of many I could give, but God meets people where they are. And if you want to know what God is doing in the Bible, then a little bit of work at that original context is important before, you know, it's easy for us to just take the text and apply it to our lives and, mm -hmm. and maybe completely miss what God was doing. Right, and I think that's the beauty of God is, is that God is so big yet so reachable at the same time mm -hmm. that he tries to present things to us in a way that we can take it and we can apply it, but also it will confuse the mess out of us if we overthink it. And so we keep digging and digging and trying harder and harder to get something out well, of it. Look at, look at when Jesus was here. Half the things he said, people were kind of like, what? Yep. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And it took them a while, I think, to get past that jolt and realize, well, I suppose if God is going to reveal himself, it might surprise us now and then. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. maybe why we call it God's prophetic it's surprises. Surprise. Yay, that, good good segue. That, that, maybe, <laughs> that maybe when we're really connecting with God, we're going to be surprised. Mm -hmm. We can't assume that our silly human way of looking at the world is, is, is comprehending everything that, that's about God. When you really touch the word, you're going to be changed. It's going to change your mind and change your life. So the two men who were walking with Jesus after the resurrection, even though they'd been with Jesus three years, hmm. missed the point. Yeah. And he had to completely say, it all fits here and it all ties together. Mm -hmm. They hadn't seen it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. could, could I just yes. add to, uh, back to what Sarah was saying about, you know, you come to Revelation and there is a sort of barrier because mm -hmm. its reputation isn't it's very good. Terrifying. Bad reputation. It's so, so we are saying that now, first now that this book exists because God is a communicating God. Yes. God mm -hmm. talks, he informs. It says, gave and, him to show. And in a bigger context of the book of Revelation, there is a big cover up. There is, you know, something has been hidden, something mm -hmm. has been concealed. Someone is actively trying to keep the truth from coming out. Yes. So revelation is also an expose. It is, all, you know, uncovering, taking off the lid, exactly. you know, and the stuff that the other side in this conflict wants to hide, now it will come uh. open. So, so revelation in that sense is like WikiLeaks or yeah. something, <laughs> like, something like that, you know, and and. and and not, not destruction, that's not the And if it's message. for the last days, the closer we get to the last days, the more clear it should be. Then, then uh, your interest should rise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please watch the show. Well, uh, Sarah, you, 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 you were saying earlier that uh, when, when some of your young friends uh, hear the word apocalypse, they think, oh, there must be zombies yeah, in there. Yeah, right? the zombie apocalypse, it always ends up back there. Yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> so the point is maybe maybe the, the way, the things we bring with us when we come to Revelation can really distort the book yeah, at times true. as well. Yeah, we bring our own baggage, for sure. We're going to give it another try. Yeah. And hope we can do this. I'm going to get to the text before we mm -hmm. finish this first show. Uh, so Revelation 1.1, 1, 1. I don't know what versions you're all using. Uh, I have the New Living here. What are you using here? I, I have it in Greek here. Yeah, he's just, way smarter than all. Just, just in <laughs> case. Well, so, you know, I said that John has been my mentor, but somebody said about John years ago, you know, he can read the book of Revelation in Greek. So I thought, well, maybe I could too. <laughs> you know, so here I am. English. <laughs> that is a good idea. What version are you bringing? Um, this one is NIV. NIV, okay. Okay, I have several versions here, but I also have two versions of the Greek. <laughs> of course. Great day. Yeah. <laughs> we bow in respect. Anyway, this is a revelation. <laughs> Mine says from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. of. of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the, the events that must soon take place. And it's always the first question in every book on Revelation. Is it a revelation about or is it a revelation from? And the Greek doesn't tell you. No, so it's both. It's a revelation about and a revelation from. I think there is no, no need for you to decide one or the other. But 
the important point, or maybe the most important point, is that God is the source. It originates with God, which God gave him. So mm. there you have God, Jesus, you, have, you know, there is a sort of cascade of, uh, you know, but the source is God mm -hmm. to, and again, back to God as a revealer. Mm -hmm. uh, and and who, who is the transparent kind of person, a transparent God, you might say. Well, coming back, you know, the word apocalypse has got, you know, connotations in today's world. But it's translated here revelation because apo is from and calypto is to cover. Mm -hmm. So what is happening here, apocalypse really means take the cover off. Mm -hmm. So when you're cooking some, you know, pressure cooker or something like that and the smells are coming out and then the kids come in the room and they say, well, you know, I wonder what's cooking. You take the lid off and mm -hmm. you can see what's cooking. And so uh, Revelation, apocalypse is not about zombies and weird yeah. stuff. <laughs> Are you disappointed? A little, a little <laughs> Just a little, uh, you know. But it, it's, it's a revelation. And what is it? A revelation of Jesus Christ, mm. which God gave him. And I, and I, I love the way you said the cascading, because there's a whole chain here, God to Jesus, to the angel, to John, to us. Mm -hmm. So we're at the receiving end of a whole a cascade or a whole chain here, but it all begins with God and it's an uncovering of God in ways that we hadn't, you know, seen before. So you could say maybe this show is prophecy as you've never heard it before because we're seeking uh, to understand that clearer, deeper message that's sometimes overlooked. So let, let, let me try to, you know, really... Interpret really, what I just said. No, yeah, really okay. uh, <laughs> drive this home. So there are two specific verbs in the first verse, both of which mean make known, to make things known. Mm, yeah. And then there are two other words that also have that connotation, make known. Make known, make known, make uh -huh. known. What does that make God? It makes God into a known maker, mm. you know, somebody mm. who yeah. makes known. That's a very deep characteristic of God. And, and does, that, does that resonate? Could, could that resonate in our time? I, seems, seems to me it could. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> in, yeah. my, in my small groups or in, in staff, once in a while I'll have someone, when we ask a hard question about God, you know, does God know the future absolutely, or whatever the hard question is, somebody will say, we're not supposed to know. We're not mm. supposed to ask those questions. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts, you know, and all of those texts. Does God really want to be known? Does it matter what we think about God? Or is it just you just love him and believe in him and worship him? And, or should we think about it? We got about 40 seconds, so quickly. Commercial. He just wrote a book on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so God wants us to know more than we want to know. So the initiative here for knowing is on God's side. It's stronger on God's side than on our side. Yes, you know, we can come to God with our questions, but God's willingness to inform and, and disclose is probably stronger than our wish to know. Yeah, know? and that's the exciting part of the journey is, is that there's always something more to be known, yes. but there's yes. pockets that we get that we can hold on to and be like, this is beautiful. And that's mm. why when we come together, it becomes more and more beautiful because we all have our pockets to share with each other. We hope you'll watch again God's prophetic surprises. God bless you.